Hi everybody, it's Mrs. Blaylock. I'm not feeling good today, so I'm trying to get you guys some information so that you don't get behind. And I apologize if you hear my daughter in the background or um, the cat jumps up here. I'll have to pause the video, but I just want to get you caught up a little bit. So um, we left off last class talking about even, I mean, increasing, decreasing, and constant. And um, what we didn't go into too much detail about was the domain. So Here's one example. If we had a function um, that's broken into different pieces, we're going to talk about piecewise functions in a couple classes. So this function here, if I wanted to know where it was increasing, decreasing, or constant, so from the left to the right, if I follow it, it's looking like it's decreasing up to negative 2. And over here on the end, there really should be an arrow implying that the function continues to go on in that direction. So how far left does the function start decreasing? So I'm going to put decreasing. Far, how far left? It goes on and on. So I'm going to say negative infinity. And it stops decreasing. It looks like at negative 2. And then there is no, if I keep going to the right, there's no other place where it decreases. So that's the only place where it decreases. Increasing. Uh, it starts to increase here, so from negative 2, and the x value is from the left, from negative 2, it increases until I get to 0, and then 0, it drops, uh, jumps up to 3, and then it continues to increase. So right here, it's still a function. The only place it's on the graph at x equals 0 is 3, but it still continues to increase up until almost 5. So I'm going to say up to 5, it's increasing, and then it jumps down and it's starts to be constant. So increasing stops at 5. And then constant is where you have a horizontal line. It remains flat. So at x equals 5, it starts to become constant. And it remains constant up to, well, it looks like 8. And I don't have a bracketed because this is an open circle. So it's decreasing, increasing, and constant. Now if I wanted to talk about the domain, the main is the x value. So I would say x such that. And so we have to consider the domain. The domain is how far left can I go? How far right can I go? Since there's an arrow and it points that way, how far left does the function go? It goes on and on and on. So from negative infinity and then how far right. So if I follow this, I have to make sure there's no places where I skip. So again, at zero, there is a value. It's filled in here, just not down there. And at five, there is a value. It's down here, not up there. And up at 8, there is not a value. So it goes all the way until 8 from left to right, but 8 is not included. And if I wanted to figure out the range, that's our output. So I would say my y values. How far low is the function? So how far down? So this is the bottom point in anything that I see. So that's a y value of negative 2. And then how far up? What's the highest point? So even though there's pieces where it jumps, over in this part of the function, it's continuous. So from when x is 0, my output is not 2, it's 3. But over here, when my x is negative 4, it looks like it's negative 2. And then when it's negative 4.5, it's almost 2, 3. So it's continuous. So going from bottom to top, there's a place on the graph where it exists. And again, it might look like it stops, but there's an open circle. And again, the graph continues over here. So you really just look for what's the lowest part, what's the highest part. And if there was any gaps, then you would identify that. So since there's an arrow, it goes to infinity. So that's how we would uh, identify our domain and our range. There's another example here. We want to determine if this one is even, odd, or neither from the graph. And then we can also talk about domain and range. And we could talk about increasing and decreasing too. So I, <clears throat> it's, it's constant here. So from 2, 3, 4, 5, negative 5 until 4, it's constant. We can write it that way. Negative 5 to negative 4, it's constant. And then you can see it's also constant here from 0 the x value of 0 to 1. So I'm going to join those two intervals with a u from 0 to 1. And then my screen went away, so I wasn't sure if I'm still recording, but I guess I still am. So then I can also do decreasing. So from um, negative 4, it decreases down to 0. 
negative 4 to 0. And it also decreases here, so I would say from x is 1 to x is 2, there's an arrow, it keeps on going. So I'm going to union 2 to infinity is where it's decreasing. Increasing, we'd go from 1 to 1, oh, negative 1 to 1, sorry. Ne x value, x value. X value is 1, x value is 2, so you got to think about it. So the x value is 1, and the x value is 2, even though the y values go from negative 1 to 1. So my x values, that's where it's increasing. I want to talk about the domain. The domain, how far left do I go? So I'm going to say x such that. How far left? I have a closed circle, so it's about negative 5, but I can't go any farther left, so negative 5 in my x values. How far to the right? Well, if I follow this function to the right, it keeps on going, so to infinity. How about my range? My y values, such y belongs to the set of, so y of our low, the arrow goes all the way down, so negative infinity. And how far? Up. So I don't have to, I could just trace it. Is that the highest point? No, I keep tracing. That's the highest point. So how high is that? That's one, two, three, up until three. And three is included. It's on the graph and it stops there. So this time I'm going to have a bracket. This function is not even. This function is not odd. So this function is neither. No symmetry about the y-axis. No symmetry if I turned it upside down. Okay, so the next section that we need to get into is talking about the average rate of change. In your textbook, the average rate of change is described starting on page 167. And so I talked about an example in class, in, in one of my classes, um, using the function, and I'll have you graph it as well, y equals 0.7x cubed plus 2x squared plus x. Go ahead and put that into your graphing calculator so you can pause the video while you do that. Okay, hopefully you've had time to graph it and it should look something like this. I'm trying to hold my hand steady so you can see my screen. So I've graphed 0.7x cubed plus 2x squared plus x. This is a parent function of x cubed because the highest exponent is to the third power. So it looks like this function from left to right is increasing and then at about negative 1.6, it starts to decrease. And then at about negative 0.3, it starts to increase again. And then it goes on and on. So if I was going to talk about what the behavior is for this function, I would talk about the interval from negative infinity to negative 1.6 as increasing. And from with the union of from negative 0.3 until infinity, it's increasing. And then I also would say from negative 1.6 to about negative 0.3, the function is decreasing. So in one of my classes, I said, what if I picked, using the definition that x1 smaller than x2 and f of x1 is smaller than f of x2? That's a definition for increasing. So if I picked an x1 that was, let's say, 2.5, my output is about negative 1. And if I picked an input of, let's say, 0.5, my output is about 1.1. I'm going to write, I'm going to pause the video and write that down so I don't make you too dizzy. All right, so hopefully you can see the graph on your calculator. And I wrote down everything that I was talking about. So it's increasing from negative infinity to one, negative 1 1.6, and it's increasing from negative 0.3 to infinity. It's decreasing from negative 1.6 to negative 0.3. But the definition of increasing says from x1, if x1 is less than x2 and f of x1 is less than f of x2, then the function is increasing over an open interval. So the interval is really important. So if I just only take the algebraic definition of increasing, I use the algebraic parts, I say, let's say x1 was that negative 2.5, f of x1 would be f of uh, negative 2.5, it's about negative 0.9. If I do x squared equals 0.5, then it's 1.1. So is negative 2.5 smaller than 0.5? It is. Is f of x1 smaller than f of x2? It is. So 
it kind of looks like it's increasing, but you know that the picture of the graph in has parts where it increases, decreases, and then increases again. So this leads us into um, the average rate of change. And the average rate of change is really going to tell us how much has it increased or how much has it decreased. And it's important that you pay attention to the slope of the secant. We're going to talk about what that is. Um, and so I think you probably understand this would not be a good interval because you've got the graph changing. And I will um, show you a couple more pictures. I'm going to pause it here for a second. Okay, so the average rate of change is really how much a function is increasing or decreasing. It's a way of of sort of having a measure. And I was trying to think, like, why would this even be important to learn? And I think back to one of the classes that I took in college, and we had to find a bound. So, like, my x1 and my x2 would be a bound. We'd pick a range of values and then say, is it increasing or decreasing? So I might say it's increasing without having graphed it. Or sometimes, if you're not sure if you have the right you probably can hear my daughter playing with minions in the background. I apologize. Um, you might hear, you might like have your domain and you might say, okay, it's increasing. But like if you're graphing calculator, you don't have the right window. Sometimes it's hard to tell if you have the right window, especially when you're first learning what functions look like. Once you know what parent functions are, like this is cubic, you kind of know it's supposed to look sort of like that S shape. Um, but you might also run into a case where you have a, table of values or data. So if you are given that, you want to know what would be the best model and, and how much is it increasing or decreasing based on the values that you have. So the average rate of change is really a measure of the slope of the secant. And so as a refresher to what a secant is, a secant in geometry, if you remember, it was a chord and it went from one edge to another edge of the circle. So there's a nice picture on page 167, but um, generally it's in um, pre-calc, the secant, what we're going to be talking about is if I had a function, it looks something like this, and from here, my x1 value, to here, my x2 value, if I drew a line between those two points on the curve, this is my secant. So that's my secant. And the length of that line um, and the slope of that line is what we're going to use the formula of average rate of change for. Okay, so the average rate of change in our book says let x1 comma f of x1, so our input output are ordered pair, and x2, f of x2 be two distinct points. So the ordered pair, we're going to pick two different points on a line. So we might pick P and we might pick Q. So this would correlate to our x1 and this would correlate to our x2. And then our y or our f of x, our outputs. So this correlates to f of x1 and this one correlates to f of x2. Okay, so our formula is for the average rate of change, average rate of change is f of x2 minus f of x1 over x2 minus x1, which, oops, x1 which is really like the slope formula. Your slope formula is a change in y's over the change in x. So we're basically using the slope formula and we're just putting it in terms of a function. So because this is not a line, the, the black function is not a line, so we can't find the slope of the entire thing. But we can find the slope of a line that intersects the function. And p and q are two points that intersect the function. We can find the slope of that line. So we need to find the change in y over the change in x. This is a good time to learn the formula too, because we're still sort of beefing up our algebra skills and practicing um, using formulas and evaluating functions. So let's do an example. So if I was given the function uh, f of x equals x to the fourth, and we wanted to find the average rate of change, we we're going to be given an interval. So we're going to be told our x1 and our x2. So like this one was just a generic p and q, but we're going to be told that our 
our x1 really is negative 1 and our x2 is 0. So that's our interval. We're going from negative 1 to 0. And what we're calculating is the, the slope. How much did it change from that beginning part of the interval to the latter part of the interval? So I'm going to use my um, formula. Uh, f of x2 minus f of x1 over x2 minus x1. So in this case, f of x2, so that's x0. So when x equals 0 and I plug it into um, this function, so f of 0 minus f of x1, and my x1 is negative 1, minus f of negative 1, all over x2, which is 0, minus x1, which is negative 1. So if I plug 0 into the function, 0 to the fourth is 0. And f of negative 1, so negative 1 to the fourth power is 1. 0 is still in the denominator, minus negative 1 is really plus 1, so that's over 1. So then if I simplify further, I've got negative 1 over 1, which is just negative 1. So what does that mean? That means that my average rate of change on the interval from negative 1 to 0 for the function x to the fourth is negative 1. It decreased at a slope of negative one. <laughs> just be careful, it doesn't mean that the slope of x to the fourth is negative one, it just means that line between the interval, so the average change was negative one. All right, let's get cranking here. So now we've got example two, f of x is x squared. So we're gonna use find the average rate of change. So f of x2 minus f of x1 over x2 minus x1. Substitute in, so we've got f of 2, this time it's from 0 to 2, so f of 2 minus f of 0 over 2, over 2 minus 0, so f of 2, plug it in, that's 4, 2 squared is 4, 0 squared is 0, 2 minus 0 is 2, this is 4 over 2, which equals 2, that means the average rate of change is 2. So there's a couple practice problems that um, I'd like you to try, and we, you, Mr. Flamino will go over it in class. I'll go over it in class, too. But if you want to try it now, you can. It's 9 minus x squared from 1 to 3, and 9 minus x squared from negative 2 to 2. So the next thing is the difference quotient. It's related to the average rate of change. There's really kind of a nice um, explanation on page 169 at the bottom. And the average rate of change can be written as a difference quotient, and there's some substitution, so please take a look at that. But I'm going to just give you the formula for the difference quotient. So the difference quotient is f of x plus h <coughs> minus f of x over h. So what's really happening is saying when we had x2 in here, and this was x1, saying this is your original one, and this is your original one plus another distance to the right. So if this is x1, x1 plus something something more, the di distance from here going to the right, um, it gets you to x2. And then the distance is from how far from here to here did we travel, which is really x2 minus x1. So from left, right, what's the difference between my two x values? And that'll be h. And then if I start at one x value and I add something to it, I'm at my second x value. So this is just another way of writing the average rate of change, but it's a formal definition, that, and it's called the difference quotient. So let's do an example using the difference quotient. So we're given f of x equals 2x squared plus 1. Now we don't have an interval because the difference quotient applies to the function, um, and that's why it's generalized. So it's from any x to the next x. And it depends on what your h value is. Are you going to go from x equals 1 to x equals 2? Or are you going to go from x equals 1 to x equals 10? And that's how the h changes. Your, your h would be 10. It would be however much you changed. So my formula is f of x plus h minus f of x over h. So we're just going to leave the h's in place when we do this work. So now if I want to find f of x plus h, we'll do it in, in steps, but in the end you're going to have to write it together. So for the first time through we'll do it in steps. So let's find f of x plus h first. 
So I have to plug x plus h into my function. So f of x plus h equals 2, parenthesis. I'm going to use like a filler. So wherever I see an x, I have to put an x plus h. And it's still squared plus 1. So that's f of x plus h. And we can simplify that, and we're going to have to um, expand our binomial or use FOIL. Okay, I apologize for the video quality because the kids are getting crazy in the background. So hopefully you can still see this, see what I'm writing. So if I just do f of x plus h first, I want to remind you that when you square a binomial, you have to FOIL. So you can't distribute it. you got to do it order of operations. you got to do what's in the parentheses and then exponents before you multiply. So I'm going to have two times, I have to FOIL this. So this is x plus h times x plus h. That's another way of writing it, if that helps you remember. So I still have my 2. I should have an equal sign here. So I'm going to do x times x, which is x squared. And then I'm going to do um, x times h. So add xh. Then I'm going to do h times x. So add xh and h times h, which is h squared. I still have plus 1. Now I can distribute my 2. So this is 2x squared plus, this is 2xh, and that's another 2. So that's 4xh plus 2h squared plus 1. So that's all f of x plus h. We also need to know what f of x is, but f of x is just our original here because we're going to subtract f of x. So if I was going to write this whole thing out, we would start here. So we would say f of x plus h minus f of x all over h. And I would write that as 2 times x plus h squared plus 1 minus, and I would recommend putting it in parentheses because you've got to make sure that you're subtracting the whole thing. So I'm going to change colors. 2x squared plus 1 all over h. So now we already simplified this part, which is f of x plus h right here. So this is going to be 2x squared plus 4xh plus 2h squared plus 1 minus 2x squared minus 1. I have to distribute that negative all over h. Let's scooch it up so you can still see. So we can simplify, and the 2x squareds cross out. So this 2x squared and this 2x squared crosses out. The 1 and the 1 crosses out. So I am left with 4xh and 2h squared. 4xh and get some paper under here. 4xh and 2h squared all over h. So I can, in the numerator, I have two h's up here. I have an h in the numerator and an h in the numerator. So I could rewrite that as h times 4x plus 2 all over h. The reason I rewrote it was to show you that you can't just cross stuff off when there's a plus sign in the middle. But because I factored out an h and an h is being multiplied, now I can cross it off. So my final answer, my difference quotient is 4x plus 2. Oh, it was h squared. I should still have an h here. 2h. 4x plus 2h. So if we go back, it's h squared. If I factor out 1h, I've got 2h in there. 4x plus 2h. That's my difference quotient. And um, the only thing that I didn't mention was that when you're using the difference quotient, h can't be zero. The reason is because um, you don't want to have a zero in the denominator because it's undefined. The other reason is if you go back to the picture, if h is zero from here to here, I didn't move. I'm just at that point. So you're not going to be able to find a slope of a point. So it's for two reasons. If you just look at algebraically, you can't have a zero in the denominator. If you look at it. Um, graphically, you're not going to want to find the difference quotient because you don't have a difference. You're staying at the same place. H is telling you how much you're going to change. 
Okay, example two, I um, would ask you to pause the video. I'm going to do the work while you're paused, and then I'm going to restart the video and show you all of my work on the paper. You can check yours. Okay, so I've written down all my work. Hopefully you've tried the problem. So you set it up f of x plus h minus f of x over h, plug it in, make sure that you subtract the whole f of x, so x squared minus x, and then I expand it. I foiled x plus h to get x squared plus 2xh plus h squared, and then I distributed my negative to the negative x negative h right here, and then I also distributed this negative, so I got negative x squared plus x, and then I crossed off in orange the um, terms, I cross each other off, the x squared and the negative x squared, the negative x and the x, and I circled the what would I saw left in the 2xh, h squared, and minus h, I had an h, so I was going to factor that out, so I circled those h's, factored my h out here, so h out of 2xh is just 2x, h out of h squared is positive h, and h out of negative h is negative 1. That allowed me to cross up an h from the numerator and the denominator. I'm left with 2x plus h minus 1, where h doesn't equal 0. That is my difference quotient. So take a look at that if you didn't get the same thing or you got stuck along the way. Here's another example um, that I'd like you to try. Find the difference quotient for x squared minus 1. Uh. And the answer is on page 171 in the book. And then you can also try 5x minus x squared. This one's in a little bit of a different order. Make sure that you distribute your negatives. So that covers everything I wanted to catch you up with today. I'm sorry that I'm not there to be with you. Um, Please watch the video and take notes, and if you have time, I'll write down some problems on the Google Classroom that I'd like for you to try when you're done finishing watching the video and taking notes, and I will see you all on Monday. Have a good weekend.